Hello everyone and welcome to this um, Social Europe videocast. Uh, my name is Robin Wilson, I'm the editor of Social Europe. And with me today I have uh, Natalie Tachi, uh, director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali and a special advisor to successive EU high representatives for foreign and security policy, Federica Mogherini and Josep Borrell. Um, you're very welcome, um, Natalie. Um, I love it. Love and we're talking today in the context of a project which is uh, focused on the challenges facing social democracy in this decade, which is supported by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the Foundation for European uh, Progressive Studies. Well, Natalie, it would be fair to say that the Social Democratic Party in Italy has a quite specific trajectory um, emerging from the Italian Communist Party, which had taken a uh, Euro-Communist distance from Moscow. It morphed over the decades into the Democrats of the left and now simply the Democratic Party. While there have been ups and downs in popular support over that time, however, the trend has been one of a secular decline. And I've lost count of the number of left-wing activists from the NGO world who have bemoaned what they have seen as the PD's misplacement of its moral compass. Uh, do you think the party has a clear sense of where it goes in this decade? And does it have the capacity to recover its one-time strength, in your view? Okay, Robin, so what I would say is that um, I think it's useful to divide this period up as in, you know, so beginning with the, the end of the Cold War and therefore um, eventually the, um, the, the, the morphing of the Communist Party in what has now become the Democrat Party. I mean, in that journey, I think it's useful to first mark um, the evolution uh, during the uh, let's call it so-called uh, liberal international order period, um, and and then essentially sort of understand or try to understand and unpack what has happened afterwards, or with the demise, or with at the very least the weakening huh, of that liberal international order. So I think if you take sort of essentially the first thirty years huh, uh, after after the end uh, of the Cold War. Basically, you have a indeed a sort of social democracy in um, in Italy that, in a sense, kind of goes along a journey that is not dissimilar uh, to the journey sort of undergone by other uh, social democratic parties. And so, you know, at the time in which indeed you know this was the liberal international order, this was the end uh, of history. Uh, inevitably, perhaps, uh, uh, given the international context, you had a uh, sort of social democracy that moved uh, from the left to the centre. Uh, so in a sense, I think the journey that the Democrat Party has been on has been fundamentally the same. Uh, I mean, sort of mentalities and mentalities, depending on different national contexts, um, from the journey that, you know, the Labour Party uh, has been on in the United Kingdom, uh, or the so Social Democrats have been on in, uh, uh, in Germany or in other countries. Uh, so I, I don't see something that is fundamentally different in that respect. And it taken uh, at that level, then indeed, uh, so people that recognize themselves uh, more with the left of the center left, uh, uh, obviously feel increasingly um, sort of unrepresented by what has essentially become uh, a party which is a sort of core element of the establishment and as it's moved to the centre in the Italian context has essentially meant the morphing uh, of the, the, the left of, the, of Christian democracy joining together uh, with, if you like, the right uh, of the Communist Party. And that's basically what the Democrat Party is. Now, um, the moment in which this really came to its sort of apex in, in, in Italy was obviously under Matteo Renzi. Uh, so in many respects, you know, Matteo Renzi was Tony Blair's, uh, was, was the UK's Tony Blair. Um, but, but I think, and this is why I would divide it up in, in kind of different periods, um, I think essentially um, that period came to 
flows. I think, you know, the defining moment uh, were really the uh, elections in, 20, uh, uh, in 2018 that essentially saw for the first time the coming into office of a government that did not represent um, the traditional uh, sort of division between left and right, but rather the new vertical uh, uh, division, uh, if you like, let's call it uh, uh, sort of, you know, the, the open, closed, uh, internationalist, nationalist, uh, establishment, anti-establishment divide. Um, and, and basically, you know, the minute in which that happened, all of a sudden the Democrat Party not only had moved to the centre, but also became increasingly characterised with the establishment, the international, the globalist agenda, etc. But also the Europeanist, and therefore the anti-nationalist, uh, uh, the anti-populist uh, agenda. Now, this meant that on the one hand, it gained back some support amongst those that felt uncomfortable with uh, the, the nationalist uh, variant, including of the left, and this was mainly captured by the Five Star Movement, but it also alienated others. So it alienated others because not only was there, as I said, a movement of the centre, but there was also uh, an, an increasing association uh, with, with the establishment. I think added to this is also the fact that um, Essentially, the Democrat Party has been in government, I mean, since the fall of Berlusconi, uh, so basically since the Monti government in Italy, has essentially been in government most of the time. And it's been government most of the time, uh, often not having won elections. <laughs> uh, and, and normally this is, you know, without getting into the nitty gritty of kind of, you know, domestic Italian politics, but this has kind of largely been um, the product of the fact that, um, you know, the, the Democrat Party has increasingly become associated with the party of the state. The way in which the Democrat Party would put it is that it represents responsibility uh, in times of the kind of, in the perma crisis that we're living through, from the Eurozone crisis, migration, Brexit, the pandemic, now the war, the Democrat Party represents responsibility. Well, this is how they would portray themselves. And as I said, this is something that has alienated some, but has also brought back uh, others into the uh, uh, democratic, the, the democratic party uh, fold. So at the moment, where's the party at? You know, uh, well, we're literally having this conversation <laughs> on the day in which the Draghi government uh, is literally as probably uh, you know only minutes away from uh, from from its end. Um, so we're headed into an incredibly uncertain and unstable uh, period. Uh, but whether or not the elections take place this fall, this, uh, you know, whether it's in October, in December or in February, I mean, I think at this point it becomes highly unlikely that they will take place uh, in spring. The Democrat Party essentially at the moment is, in fact, polling as the first party. Um, the problem is that it's a first party that is unable to uh, win a majority uh, in, in a coalition. Uh, and um, given the way in which the electoral law uh, works, and it has not been reformed in Italy, uh, this is obviously insufficient to be given a mandate to form a government. Um, and so let's see what, what happens. But I would say that in, in, the, in, in, in the journey that the Democrat Party has been on in the context of in a sense, this rise of nationalist populism, not only in, in Europe, not only in Italy and in Europe, but of course also uh, in the United States, this has, I think, marked a different period. I mean, this has got, it's, it's something that has now gone beyond, quote unquote, only uh, the shifting of the Democrat Party to the center. It's also an increasing association of the Democrat Party with the state, with responsibility, but also with Europe, with the international community. Um, it's the anti-nationalist uh, party uh, by, by definition. Very clearly also in terms of its positioning now on the war uh, in Ukraine. It's the only party, literally, that has taken a very strong and firm stance against Russia. 
uh, other parties for very different reasons, uh, whether it's because uh, of the nationalist populist uh, sort of, uh, you know, nod and, and wink uh, to, uh, to the Kremlin, uh, whether it's because of business interests, whether it's because of energy interests, you name it, have all been rather ambiguous uh, on the board. The Democrat Party has really kind of kept the bar straight. And this, as I said, has won it support on the one hand, but has also created uh, new problems on the other. That's fascinating, and that reminded me of how, uh, on, in, in the period of the Soviet Union, the uh, Soviet Communist Party um, condemned the Italian Communist Party for um, some expression of uh, dissidence, which was not deemed legitimate. And there was an editorial in Lunita, the Communist Party newspaper, which said there are no communist Vaticans. And um, uh, from what you're saying, it still seems to be the case that the uh, Democrat Party uh, has a... Um, Healthy scepticism about what comes out of uh, Moscow with that regard. But I want now to turn to, to want to turn now to the international level, um, Natalie, and your uh, prime area of expertise, because the war in Ukraine has obviously reminded all of us that international solidarity has to be at the heart of any social democratic project. And probably more than anyone else in Europe, Natalie, you've been thinking through over the years what a progressive European international policy means in today's world. So can you sketch for our viewers what that looks like? And specifically, since the phrase feminist foreign policy has entered official discourse in social democrat-led countries in Sweden eight years ago and laterally under the new uh, German coalition, how do you think foreign policy can indeed be feminist? Mm. Okay, so perhaps three points and then a few words on the feminist uh, foreign policy. So I think sort of, you know, point number one on what is a progressive foreign policy, I would say uh, as European countries, uh, it's a European uh, uh, foreign policy, meaning it's a foreign policy that acknowledges the fact that uh, there are no national and therefore nationalist solutions uh, to the major global challenges of our age. Uh, whether this is security, whether this is digital, whether it is climate, um, energy, I mean, literally, you, you name it, demography, but essentially there is, there are no nationalist solutions. And so to me, that is, as European countries, that recognition automatically means that you need to try and project, including what your national interests are, through a foreign policy within a European uh, setting. I would say that then the sort of second uh, pillar of what a progressive foreign policy um, is and, and it should be is really one that puts climate and the energy transition at the core. And, um, and this means different things. Huh? Uh, I mean, it means obviously on the one hand, putting the climate crisis on the core, at the core, uh, which basically means uh, giving far greater emphasis than what has been done up until now to especially climate adaptation policies. I say especially climate adaptation, uh, given that I think the climate mitigation policies can largely be leveraged through the private sector, whether, whereas climate adaptation, which is less profitable uh, uh, in, in many respects, uh, really does require the role of the state, uh, uh, the role of the public sector, of institutions, uh, in a far greater uh, way. So I would say climate crisis on the one hand, but also looking at the other side of the coin, putting climate and the transition at the centre also means uh, acting and sort of developing a foreign policy that accounts for the social, economic, and therefore also political and geopolitical implications and consequences of the transition. I explain what I mean. The energy transition is going to go ahead regardless. Other transitions have happened in the past. There's been the transition from wood to coal, coal to oil. Uh, you know, there will be the transition from oil and gas. Uh, onto 
renewables mm-hmm. and, and from renewables to something else. I mean, you know, we probably even in our lifetime, huh, we're going to end up looking at renewables as being kind of, you know, prehistoric forms of green uh, technologies. And um, so the transition will go ahead. The point is that given the climate crisis, it needs to happen at a much, much, much faster pace uh, than previous transitions. And given the magnitude of the change and given the speed at which it needs to take place, this is a revolution, literally. It's a revolution, and all revolutions have winners and they have losers. And the losers um, have to be compensated. Huh? They have to be kind of brought along this journey. Uh, and this means both compensating the losers inside our own societies, but this is obviously not the subject of foreign policy, strictly speaking, but also compensating the potential losers, both within and between countries, uh, of the transition itself in neighboring countries, in, you know, sort of in the wider world. Uh, and so I think that this is really something which has not at all really featured uh, in the foreign policy uh, discussion, which I really do think that should be at the core of what progressive foreign policy should look like. The third pillar, which kind of brings us also closer to the debate now over the war in Ukraine, is, you know, how to reconfigure the relationship to uh, and with uh, the so-called global south. Um, It has really been quite striking how, notwithstanding the obscenity uh, of this war and the fact that looking at it from a European standpoint, the right and the wrong is just so blatant, and yet that has not obviously been that obvious in other parts of the world. And I think a progressive foreign policy needs to really ask itself those difficult questions as to why that is the case. Now, I don't think there is one answer, and I don't think there is one policy in response to this. I think that it has partly got to do with self-criticism. Uh, it has partly got to do with acceptance. Right? I mean, there has to be a degree of acceptance because otherwise we will never go beyond a Eurocentrist foreign policy. Acceptance that our wars are not everyone's wars. Uh, so there has to be you know, an element of self-criticism, an element of acceptance, but there also has to be an element of, of outreach and engagement. Uh, and, you know, so they're trying to unpack all those many shades of grey, trying to avoid as much as possible that the world recrystallizes um, into a sort of West versus rest dynamic, in which, let's face it, we're going to have a short straw uh, in tomorrow's world. And so we have all of the interest uh, in unpacking those many shades of grey rather than pushing countries necessarily to belong in, in a black or white uh, world. So I think that's, to me, the third key pillar of what a progressive foreign policy should uh, should look like. Now, coming to the feminist uh, foreign policy, um, I think essentially what a feminist foreign policy should look like, uh, beyond the obvious, uh, meaning getting more women involved, uh, which is kind of you know always a good and important thing to the extent that obviously there are not uh, enough of them, particularly in certain sectors, uh, of, uh, of, of foreign policy, security, defence, I would add industry, uh, you know, sort of e- energy, uh, finance, as, you know, consider, I'm, I'm looking here, obviously, at foreign policy as being a sort of, you know, you know, sort of looking at it as the, um, you know, external dimension of all policies. Uh, and that's really what we should have in mind when we think, I think, about, about foreign policy. So particularly in certain sectors, as I said, finance, energy, defence, Clearly, the actual presence and involvement of women is insufficient. But I think a a feminist foreign policy should also, and perhaps principally, be be about how do you um, uh, sort of insert in the way in which you do foreign policy um, ways and means that uh, can be more if you like, female in nature, which means that men can have them too, uh, you know, and, and as applied to precisely those three areas that I was referring to earlier, how do you inject, in a sense, that greater degree of empathy and listening and understanding? As I said, these are all qualities which are 
stereotypically, in a sense, associated to women more than men. But of course, it does not mean that men don't and can't have them. So to me, that's the main way in which I would understand the feminist foreign policy. It's about the way in which foreign policy is done, rather than only about how many women you have sitting around the table. Thank you, Natalie. That was a fascinating um, survey of an awful lot of things um, in a very short uh, space of time. And I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, you've been listening to Natalie Tocci, the director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali and special advisor to successive EU high representatives for foreign and security policy, Federico Mogherini and Josep Borrell. Many thanks, um, Natalie, and many thanks to all our viewers and listeners.